meeting, those of you that you know came to pray, and we we want to see God work, uh, not just in this conference, it's, it's for our lives. And I think it's great to pray one for another, and we encourage you to keep that prayer sheet and uh, pray for that person. Um, at this particular point in time, I remember like the last conference in St. Kitts, um, President Robert said some things to me. He said, listen, um, I have some ideas, some things I want to present, some conference, uh, some changes we perhaps need to make, and uh, not to change our structure in terms of what we're all about, uh, the core, but to, I guess you could call it, add flavor, or to give us a direction in such a way as to solidify what we're doing, to enhance the things that we're doing already in a better form and fashion. So uh, I know you, I don't know all of them, but I know you wanted to discuss it with the conference in the arts so we could put in the time. But the Lord worked with the, our, our meeting. We had planned the schedule, and as you know, book is kind of going early, and by the time book has come back, uh, some folks weren't able to make it. I got one friend, he had two funerals this week. He was been here, two funerals this week he had to deal with. There were others who went into some situations, but we're delighted that we could be here. Like I said this morning, I'm excited for the preacher who's preaching the first message. Uh, uh, not tonight, I guess. What tonight? Thursday night, right? Thursday night. And uh, I believe you're going to be excited also. Um, so, President Roderick, you come and present to us. And we know this, this is a, a like a business meeting, but it's not a business meeting. So it's important. So come on. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I guess everybody got something to eat, am I right? Yes. You are not sleepy, are you? No. No, so stay with me. I want to say thanks to Pastor Adams for affording us the opportunity to be able to share some of the things that I believe the Lord has laid on our hearts. Uh, since you have asked us to uh, be responsible for uh, guiding this conference from the I must say for the next two years because one gone. We went home and started looking at some of the things that that we believe needs to be done in order to really take this conference the way it's supposed to go. First of all, I want to say a special thanks to uh, those who started with us in this Baptist Fellowship Conference. Uh, they had a vision for us for the conference. They started. And then for all of those who worked along with the conference over the years up to now, a special thanks to each and every one. You know that sometimes certain things get us to a certain distance, and then after that we need to stop and look at where we are, look at where we want to go, and then put vehicles in place that will get us there. Or then we will keep drifting along, drifting along, and lose the, the, the taste, the flavor, everything that we're supposed to have, we will lose if we don't stop and pay attention to it. We need to stop and pay attention to our own lives, where we are, how we got here, and where we would like to be, and put in place the things that uh, we, we would need to put in place to get us to where we are to be. So, with that said, again, I say thanks to everyone and thank you for being here. I know that this is a, a small group and we're not still conference, so I'm not sure that decisions uh, should be made or uh, can be made based on the number of pastors that are missing. But I, 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 I want to share some information with you and I would also like to get some, some feedback from you. This is, because this is not my conference, this is our conference, and to see what we can do. I like the verse that's found in John chapter 9 and verse 4. I must walk the walk of him that sent me while it is day that I come at when no man can walk. I must walk the walk of him that sent me while it is day that I come at when no man can walk. So if it, uh, understanding this, it seems like this is part of my life. So I must do the walk then. He said me to do. I'd like to introduce this morning the Vice President. Why are you sitting in the second seat, uh, Pastor Maynard? And I'm glad that it's not two bald head men. 
Coach <laughs> versus at home, uh, not too long ago, gray hairs are taking over. <laughs> gray hair. Uh, and uh, I trust one of these days, maybe, maybe you may get to hear. But he is a younger man, he just stand past him. He's from Davis, as the vice president. Our sister Lana is our assistant secretary treasurer. He just stands as the Lana. And she is everything today because the treasurer and the secretary is sick and unable to be here. Remember the prayer for her, Sister Carrie Wallace. Please remember the prayer for her. She would have loved to be here, but it's a new replacement and has been given us some problems mm -hmm. ever since. She didn't. Okay, so remember the prayer for her. And we want to run these things by you this morning. Okay. We would like to have you input uh, these right. things that we are going to write in there. Yeah. Uh, you want to find me up and down, up and down, up and down. And, uh, and uh, I, walk I will start by being done. Good morning, everybody. I do want to say I'm honored and privileged to be a part of this conference for many years, even though my presence wasn't always here. Um, I obviously grew up in a pastor's home and thank God for this fellowship and uh, even as I reflect on um, the leadership and uh, Dr. Ray Thompson who was a mentor for my dad and uh, so I've always felt affiliated and connected to this conference and happy for the opportunity and privilege that it is today to serve in this capacity. Um, also thank God for Pastor Webster and for his leadership and for his willingness to really help to consolidate what has been done over the last uh, several years and to look forward to what will be done in the future. As Pastor Webster indicated, um, I don't know how many of you, does everybody have a handout? Okay, all right. Uh, so there's just a number of uh, suggestions and strategies that we want to propose, and, um, and so some of them I'll be speaking to, and some of them Pastor Webster will be speaking to, but feel free to ask questions and provide any for input is really what this meeting is all about. Uh, the first uh, suggestion and recommendation that we have that we want to be able to propose is that of having a conflict resolution committee. Uh, you know, I uh, was been married now for 20 years this past December, and one of the things that I've learned and read, as well as it relates to even that sacred relationship, is that if you can handle conflict, you enhance greatly your chances of having a very good marriage because all of us can survive well and enjoy good times. It's the bad times that often trip us up. And so as it relates to our churches, obviously we are very proud and I am proud of our biblical heritage and our adherence to uh, the local autonomous independent Baptist churches. And in no way, by proposing a conflict resolution committee, would that committee seek to overstep its bounds or to, uh, in some way, uh, undermine the authority of the local independent Baptist church. However, um, oftentimes there is scenarios and situations where we feel that uh, maybe an outside voice of individuals who, of course, will be respected uh, and who will be spiritual men can provide assistance, can provide some guidance, can provide a mutual voice, uh, and also provide recommendations uh, that can help to be able to resolve conflicts that can arise between uh, a very particular church, or maybe something that, that would erode uh, the fellowship in a particular situation. And oftentimes, if these things can be addressed early on, in the early stages, uh, they can avoid uh, situations that often can at times can get messy and really ultimately and negatively affect uh, what we are seeking to do in building the kingdom. And so uh, this conflict resolution committee would of course be I'm sure selected by uh, us as a body and uh, men well respected who can then uh, make a group of say five, I'm just talking about a potential number, uh, five men who will be part of this committee. And at any particular time upon the invitation and the request of that particular church. It would never be a situation where uh, you would be uh, just invading uh, and not being requested, but uh, to come 
But of course, knowing that these men are there, that this committee exists, uh, then that church can seek in an effort to resolve that conflict, reach out to these men, request that they come uh, and provide some sort of guidance to, them to help bring about resolution to whatever conflict uh, we have to resolve. That's really all. If there's any questions, any thoughts, any uh, concerns about such a recommendation? Brother Jenny. So will each church reach out to these men individually, or will there be a central person uh, who will then disseminate the information to the community? All right, well, uh, we have not really sorted out all of the um, specifics of how that would function, but I would, I would suggest that in a situation like that, the church probably would reach out to uh, the executive, uh, the, uh, the president, um, and then uh, that committee, which is would be a function of the WIPF uh, fellowship, uh, then would be yeah, a definitely good question, and that's something that uh, if I was how it would function, I would recommend that would be my, my thoughts. So that it's not, we're not functioning, that committee is not functioning independently, uh, but functioning under the uh, authority of the government. Yeah. Does anybody think that's a, a good idea? Does anybody think that's, uh, that's uh, something that would appear workable or within our current arrangement and how we function as churches, both individually and then collectively as a fellowship? Any thoughts on that? Any other question quickly? I know that we have the edge for this. Okay. 
Okay. Yes, sir. Some years ago, the uh, Baptist International Mission had a similar uh, program where um, the, their churches were giving to a particular account um, periodically, and they would keep that. Uh, they were using it uh, for mission uh, to, to set up churches. And I, I don't know where they used to have that, and I think it's the same principle as it relates to what you're talking about. If something like that can be done, and if periodically the once the fund is established, uh, churches or individuals can put into it for, uh, for when the time arrives, if the time should come, wherever it is needed, those funds would be there. And of course, you can also add to it as is necessary when uh, tragedy like this occurs. Amen. And that's somebody who is speaking who knows exactly what we are talking about. That's the man. And while you are on that, let me tell you our proposal for that. I, I try, if you didn't get this message from me, it would mean that I don't have your number. And I like to have every number. We put a WhatsApp group together and I sent out a video to the, the pastors and the churches, appealing to the pastors and churches for help for the rest of this Baptist function. Here's what I ask. I ask that every pastor ask their church. And, and the truth of the matter is, I have noticed over the years that if the pastor is in favor of something, they pass. They pass. The church will do if he's in favor. But if he's not in favor of it, the church will not do So it doesn't even make sense to take it to the church. So I ask the pastors if they could consider taking on West Indies Baptist Fellowship as a mission. Just like you take on a missionary and you support a missionary, I'm asking that we would take on the West Indies Baptist Fellowship as a mission. So whatever you can afford to help that mission with, monthly, Annually, however you can, we would appreciate it because that would put funds in West Indies Baptist Church. In the in the business meeting, you're going to see where where some of us took that on and what happened. Not only that, I asked that that the the, the pastor lead the congregation in taking on. I know that within the congregation, there are people in the congregation that would love to do that themselves. And I sent that out, and I also had some response from that, where we have now began to uh, be get to some funds, and that's exactly what Pastor Woodside was talking about. So the suggestion here is for us for a financial proposal, and that is for us to go back home to our churches and ask the church to take it, take West Indies Baptist Fellowship on as a mission. No, no, Pastor. What are we going to do with these funds? The funds may be for you. You may be the first person who need the funds. Now, I come from the business world. I've been doing business for over 30 years. And I'm one of those who believe that we're hostile, you must be. I believe that if you sacrifice to put in there, as soon as you got a need, I should sacrifice to make sure. And I know that we can become very spiritual and say, you know, even though somebody don't put, and they can't put, you know, we should, and I understand all of that, but I want to be honest with you. The person who really stretched their hand there would be the person that I should go to. And I'm honest, I have a store, and uh, sometimes people will go by someone else to buy, and when they go by someone else to buy, they would have a need, they didn't come to them to buy. They would have a need, and then they would request of me to help them with their needs. So I would say to them, now what do you want me to do? You want me to take the few pennies that somebody else spent with me and give it to you? You know, sometimes. So I'm asking that all of us uh, could do this. Now let me ask, is that a good idea or a bad idea? Talk to me. 
Why would it come to money be required? Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Yeah. Yes, I saw him. Thank you. Because from the time I started attending the conference, I've been wondering how come that the conference has got more in its place that even when a missionary wants to come to the conference, and they need some help that the conference really can help them. So I, I thank God for that decision that is made, that we need to have more into our knowledge as a conference to do things for the people. And coming to these conferences, what if one of these conferences fall in a hole after doing their best? What are we going to do? Just walk off and just leave them in the hole? We can't do that. We got to test the moment to maintain the rest of this Baptist fellowship. So we need to make sure that we can, and, and it's no burden on no, on nobody. It's just, just making sure that we can do our little part of that. So that's the proposal that I want to bring to you. And, and you're going to hear some more about that in our meeting. Like I said, we're going to hustle. Because there are quite a number of things that we want to share with you. Come and take two. The next proposal is that of having a financial advisory committee. Uh, and that's a good segue item out of what we just discussed. Obviously, when any individual uh, seeks to be able to entrust resources, be it whatever the nature of those resources are, particularly financial resources, it would be incumbent on those to whom uh, the authorities give them to manage those resources that they are done, they are managed uh, in a appropriate way uh, that is with stewardship, with accountability, as we know it is required with stewardship that might be found faithful. And so what, it, what we're proposing is uh, that there is a financial advisory committee selected of individuals who would be able to at least have insight uh, into what is being done with resources uh, and maybe some of these individuals would be could be individuals with expertise in accounting or whatever, but um, just to provide visibility into what takes place, transparency, um, and so that uh, there are no questions uh, related to what is done. Obviously, um, just as the Conflict Resolution Committee uh, would make recommendations, we're also saying that this committee can make recommendations to the executive body um, to be able to, uh, again, provide transparency and provide accountability as it relates to the management of resources. So we're proposing a financial advisory committee as it relates to the management of funds uh, that are entrusted into the uh, care of the University of Dr. Scottish. Any thoughts on this recommendation? Anyone opposed to such a recommendation? Yes. 
Most it is not the solution as a body would, uh, would provide um, yeah, the approval for these individuals. Yeah, the body would see that. No, no, no. These things are. Yeah, it would have to be something. How much recommendation has to be submitted? It will be done in the next meeting. Like I said, because of the numbers that we have. Speaking like later or next one? Next one. These are suggestions that we are running by you so that you have ideas to come back next time around and we got more people because I'm going to do everything that I can to get as many people as I can to the next conference so that we can do this. Uh, another question. You probably need to send up all these recommendations. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. And um, the minutes are currently being taken um, regarding what's transpiring here. Um, I'm going to move on to the next one because it will segue as well. Uh, the next idea is uh, preachers and pastors uh, were sitting at the social conference meeting. Um, obviously, uh, we strongly believe in leadership, and as Pastor Webster just mentioned, um, if a pastor is on board with a particular issue, whatever that nature may be, he generally oftentimes would have this congregation behind him. And so we believe that there is a need to be able to have uh, pastors only pastors and preachers meetings really to address some issues that, because of the sensitivity of those particular issues, do require a smaller uh, body uh, and really address some of these things. And that pastor really is a representative of that church body. Uh, and oftentimes, even as it relates to those who attend these conferences, most often uh, pastors will be the ones who uh, attend or will be representative of their particular uh, church that they are coming from. And so um, that's something that we would like to see, um, not, to be, not because it's speaking to exclude others, but it would really be uh, a representative body of the entire WWF uh, conference. I don't know whether this would take place at a conference, but it would probably be ideal to have it elsewhere, be elsewhere as well. Uh, but wherever it is, uh, that's something that we would like to see to address uh, a variety of different issues and to be effective as we seek to be able to uh, deal with some of the things that really are critical to our future and to move forward in effectively. Any thoughts on that? All right, that's what it's all about. Some years ago, spoke to several of the pastors in regards to the West Indies Baptist Fellowship Conference and tried to get from them what are we shooting at? What, what, what is it that we are doing? What we want to accomplish? After taking up the leadership, I looked for the, the vision of the conference. I think that as a conference, we need to come up with the vision of the conference and produce a vision statement and a mission statement. We need to know where we are going. We need to be able to measure if we are getting to where we are going. So if we have a vision statement for our conference, it will help to guide us in the direction. Now, we know that the Thompson and all of those that started the, the conference, we could go back to them, but pretty soon, just like you see, we get them all, and pretty soon we get them great. I could even make up Pastor Jeremiah all the way to mom. I said, I know he's here until, and I keep saying that guy be here, and, and I'm passing him like somebody I don't know until I realize that the top of his head is he ain't a young boy no more. Things change. Um, usually we would see Dr. Thompson here. He's not here anymore. Pretty soon we are going to be off the scene and then younger ones are going to come on the scene. They will not know Pastor Adams. They will not know Dr. Thompson. They will not know those of us that were way back there. And then things will go in whatever direction that they will jump things to go because we do not have the vision, the statement. So I'm recommending that we work on a vision statement. I can tell you from now, it would have to do with the with fellowship. Because you hear 
West Indies Baptist Fellowship Conference. We don't want to change that, but we have to make sure that whatever we do will drive us to this fellowship. That's what we got to do. We got to make sure that we have the vision for it and the, the mission how we want to get it accomplished. So I'm recommending that we come up with a, a vision statement. I'm already thinking of it where when Jesus was going, he left in his prayer that they be, that they be one. Got to be around that. If we're talking about fellowship, got to be around that. So we got to be walking as churches, though we are independent Baptist churches, we still got to make sure that we are one and one in Christ. Any comments? Uh, I would suggest that um, you guys have Thank you so much. Any other suggestions? Those of you, yes. Sir. I really support the, the concept of not just the vision and the city, but the idea of actually having the opportunity to present the country of God. Yeah. And one of the things I love about, about people vetting things. I don't mind that someone knocked on anything that I bring. But make sure when that's knocked on, something else happens. Yes, yes. And that's where it's at. I, I, I don't mind that you say, let's change this or let's do that, but change it to what? Don't just knock it on. You don't have nothing to offer. So when we do that, uh, we must come for our suggestions to make it better. Any other comments? <laughs> yes, sir. As they have said, the big way I have to to see that there is some form of erection where we want to be considered. I've been there with the Congress for several days and it's safe. I've been But to me, for me, that like, what am I here for? I mean, so you're getting the message, you're getting preaching, good preaching, but you should be able to do something tangible with that. Because uh, this is what we're going to do for the fellow brothers and sisters that we call our places that need help. And I'm happy for the direction that the leadership is taking. Amen. Any other comment? Those of you who believe that we should not have a vision statement, not a vision a statement this year. <clears throat> Thank you very much, that mean all of you. Um, when I sent that WhatsApp message, WhatsApp message out to all the pastors, I had a little projection. I was projecting that we can do it, and, and please don't let this right me, and raise a 50000 in the year, and we would have it as a base in the rest of this Baptist I don't ask people to do anything unless you do it with In the next meeting, you will see where we have started and how easily it can be done. So I am I'm asking you for us to look at by the next conference that we'll be able to say if we haven't reached, we reach close. By supporting this conference, so that we can have at least a foot and over 50,000 dollars, that we can do something with. Number two, big. A foot. Number two, big. Number two small? Your face small. I thought all of you would have said yes. Huh? Say that again. It depends on the currency. You know what? You know what? Because of who spoke, I probably would prefer Cayman. <laughs> uh, who 
put it up here, good girl too, and we decided to go there, you know? <laughs> but we can do that. We can do it. US Christ was really thinking about it. We can do it. We, and it's easy to be done. Uh, and I'll show you in our next business. Pastor, if we have 50 churches, I'm talking that church, 50,000. That's correct. It can be a year, it can be a month, whatever you want to do. But you can give us a space where it's a quarter, a month, six months from now. It's easy, you can always raise 100,000. If we, if, if we give $100 a month, a church to West End, and I'm just talking about the church. Yeah. And let's say we got 50 churches. In 10 months, you got 50 churches. That's just, that's just the church. I know the I know what I'm telling you. The individual people will support this. If, if one of our people gets sick and unable to pay for surgery, what are we going to do? Just sit on it. Allow that person to die. The last conference, we hug that person up and say how much we love you. No, nah, this is this is for you. This is for, for everybody. You know, so this is something that we're thinking. Take two more, brother. Let's make it quick. We got ten minutes. All right. Um, the next item is the is what we have done preparing our future leaders. Uh, I think we can take a very even casual look uh, throughout our region, throughout our churches, and recognize that uh, we have a serious need. Uh, for young men and young ladies uh, being raised up uh, to be able to be involved in the ministry of the work of the Lord. And um, it is one of the things that really burned my heart to be back in the Caribbean uh, because I really saw a birth of uh, so many churches, uh, you know, young pastors and a generation moving off the scene uh, with a void, no one gave the transition. Too. And so we want to be able to come collectively as a body and be able to prepare future leaders in a systematic way. Uh, we, of course, we don't call people to call them from God, but when God burdens a young man's heart, that we can be able to work together to be able to help train that individual, uh, whether it's through providing them an internship opportunity, whether it's through them uh, traveling to a particular island uh, for a period of time uh, be able to assist in whatever way God is calling them on, they're willing to build, <coughs> to avail themselves to be used. Um, and just a variety of different ways. Obviously, we have uh, our, our college, and we have well, this our college, the Walter College, and other institutions that are uh, seeking to be able to train. Uh, but there's also practical training as well. And I've been a beneficiary of, 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 of really having on the job training, so to speak, in preparation for the ministry. And I tell you, it is invaluable. And so we want to be able to propose uh, just really in itemizing and preparing future leaders and how can we having a heart to see the next generation raised up, work together as a body instead of independently uh, really being able to support each other uh, in that manner. Anybody has any thoughts, <coughs> any recommendations, any objections to this opportunity? Do you think that you have the power to do this? Absolutely. The fruit are ready. Anybody else? Yes, that's one of the agenda items. That's what I said. Yes, if we go right into the equipment, probably. While he was talking, Pastor Martin in my mind, Pastor Archibald in my mind, about the equipment of our leaders, and that is the Institute, which you all had here in the team that did such a great job. And uh, we can start some of those things. And we want to come outside and make sure. Because the, the truth of the matter is, the best of your men are in the church that really cannot leave. They're married. They got their families. They want to do it. If they get a little help, they'll be able to do that. So what are we going to do? Just ignore those? We need to get to them with some form of training. And then we, we would like to, let me find a place here, yeah. equipping our current leaders, equipping our current leaders. When I went to um, Good News Baptist Church uh, 
speaking of the West Indies Baptist Fellowship, I spoke to my pastor in regards to the West Indies Baptist Fellowship and I asked him if we could not just implement some leadership in the West Indies Baptist Fellowship. And uh, I was told by several pastors that this is a fellowship conference. I understand. That laid the burden on my heart to start a leadership Bodies and Caribbean Church Leadership Conference. And uh, uh, that leadership conference, I went to Dr. Tony Evans' conference. And uh, uh, well, before I went to Dr. Tony Evans' conference, I, I, I spoke with Dr. Uh, Warren, Les Warren, about this, this idea that God had laid on my heart in regards to the, this uh, leadership conference. And he said, Well, let's do it. And we started a leadership conference in St. Martin. 2005. This year's going to be 15 years that we've been having this leadership conference. Uh, after starting the leadership conference, a friend came to me and invited me to. Uh, Pastor Adam was, it was, he was there with us all the way through this. He made sure God had going. He was one of the men who said to me, This is the vision that God has laid on your heart. Just don't leave it drift, drift around the place. Just keep it going. We've been uh, keeping it going for the past. 15 years, went to Dr. Evans' conference, and someone on my way to the conference gave me a book on leadership. And when I read the book on leadership, I said, I'm going to be that, that, that uh, presenter. And I went to the conference and met the presenter, and it was uh, Dr. Uh, Evans' brother-in-law, Paul Cannons. I sat in his class, and after his class, there, there were so many people that surrounded him and just waited until I got an opportunity to be able to retag. I was from St. Martin. And uh, gave me an opportunity to speak with him, and I told him what God had laid on my heart. And he said that he was from Guyana, and God had laid on his heart to get back to his people to share some of what God has blessed them with in school. And he, he decided that he would join us, and he's been with us now every year. So we partner together with Paul Walk Ministries in having this. And our Eastern Caribbean uh, Church Leadership Conference, uh, it's going to be. June of this year, every year we have it. When we have the conference, these are some of the things that we deal with. Like we got a Bible and theology track, we teach on that. And these, uh, a lot of the professors come from the States, and many of them, they have doctor degrees about their teaching us uh, down, down here. And some of our people do also. Uh, we have a leadership track, we got a pastoral track, we got a community development track, we got a preaching track, we got a youth ministry track, we got a counseling track. We got a church development track, we got a women's track, and we got a worship track. Some 10 tracks that we work on every year, passing out information how you can be better in these areas. All of you have always been invited, and we would like to invite you to come and be with us to this Northeastern Caribbean Church Leadership Conference uh, that's going to take place in June. I'm going to give you dates, and he has some flyers that we're going to give out to you today you to come and if you got any if you got any 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 young men uh, young women that you would like to get some training we'd be more than happy to train them I'm sure I, if I if I call Pastor Adam he would bump something he would tell you what this conference means to him if I call Pastor Martin he would bump something and tell you why they sit up and keep your hand up keep your hand up she's ready to get up and tell you about the so so we're saying that we got these things in place we want you to utilize this stuff. We want you to come, we want you to come. We try to make it inexpensive as much as possible. Uh, I think the last time we got a, we got a hotel, uh, what, what was it for Martin? $30, $35? Yeah, very Th very very $35 and tell the registration $100. <coughs> we feed you, we do everything, we try our best. We invite the pastors to come, we invite the women to come, we invite everybody to come. It's, it's a ministry under the Good News Baptist Churches. Not our Dr. Webster's ministry, it's under the Good News Baptist Church, joined together with all our ministries that we have been doing this now for the past 15 years, and we would like to invite you to be a part of this. Now I'm running over time, so Pastor, uh, permit me to just go through the rest of these quickly, and, uh, and uh, so that we can turn on time. Okay, here we, here, every time we meet, it was IBYC, IBYC, IBYC. We never had a 
to be able to ex explain what's going on in IBYC to the rent home, we, I decided, well, we're going to go to wherever IBYC is, and we're going to get the pastors on that island, and we're going to get the vice president to come in. We're going to go to work, get some answers for you. We got some answers for you that we will deliver to you in the next meeting. We are suggesting that if you decide to support the West Indies Baptist Fellowship at whatever amount, whether the church or individuals, we are suggesting that every <coughs> quarterly that a report be sent to you of the funds that came in and the funds that we have and what's going on quarterly. We are looking at the idea of a group insurance for lay personnel and leaders, a life and retirement insurance, it is true that if you can get a big group of people, even though you may not be able to get in by yourself, you can get in with a group. So we're looking at that idea as soon as we get that to, to somewhere where we could um, explain, uh, get more information where we can explain what we're going to do. We're looking at our constitution and I'm sure that if you saw one, you would think that we need to make some amendments. We would bring those suggestions and those amendments to you uh, so that we can do it. One of the things that I think that West Indies Baptist Fellowship need is a website. Every young person has a website. Every church has a website. We, we, got a, we got hit with a hurricane in, a, in St. Martin. And when we got hit with a hurricane in St. Martin, it was uh, by, as soon as the plane could land, there was a group. Uh, Samaritan Ministries. Samaritan Folks. The Ministries is, is a, a insurance that can use for the men on the The Ministry, I tell you. Samaritan Folks came into St. Martin and they started just helping everybody. Then they formed the churches and they started walking through the churches. True Good News Baptist Church, they have given out hundreds of thousands of dollars. Not to us, but we found the people who needed the help and they came in. When they went back to the States, something strange happened. When they reached back to the States, there was so much money in their account, they had to fly back to St. Martin. And they stood on St. Martin for several months, not only giving money, but making sure that the money was used for properly. Now, how could they do that? The reason why they could do that is because they had a website, number one. Number two, people trust them with their money. Number three, people knew that they would go and get the job done. Not everybody who got money wanted to do the job, but many times I am more than willing to give you the money so that you could go and do the job because not all of us can go. But whether I go or you go, we want the job done. And I think if we have a, web, a proper website where we can put all this information up on, that it would be much better for us. I got to turn this over to Pastor Adams. Then I'm thinking of, in a suggestion of a website. Good idea, bad idea? You don't want to be publicized so much? Talk to That's the idea. That all these things really should have been up all the time. Yeah. You know, we just run it, just run it. Let's stop and do something. Now, when we turn it over to somebody else, we turn over something. Like that. All right? And then I am thinking of, I think West Indies Baptist Fellowship, this is a good thought to me. If it's not to you, let me know. I think West Indies Baptist Fellowship needs a tent. To start a tent ministry. Some of that they do it and they're very successful. If West Indies Baptist Fellowship had a large tent in a container with let's say 450 chairs and everything that would run a crusade out there. Why can't we have this thing in a container, move it from island to island, get the, the preachers that your people love to hear, get us to come, well, get you all to come in and preach the word and, and be effective. So we can, instead of trying to get people to come into our building, we will do what God says. We need to go out and reach them. And I think that the only thing that the country that would want the tent to be responsible for is to make sure the tent gets from your country to the other country. That's all. So it's moving, it's moving around to the Caribbean, 
this tent and this container moving around and we are doing will, evangelizing, just doing this for the Lord. Any comment? Pastor Adams, Lord. Any comment? Good idea? Bad idea? Good idea? Talk to me. Anybody against us having such a thing? No. Yes, you against? No, no, no. Tell me why. <laughs> I trust if you. If you're against anything in Good News Baptist Church, you get up and you tell me why. Because I probably I, I missed something. I fought. You fought. Okay. All right. Let me just let me just say the last one. And I hope that's the last one. They, the contact. We need your information. We need your contact. We need to be able to reach you. Uh, to let you know what's going on. Thank you so much for the time this morning. <clears throat> and our next meeting, we'll go into detail and explain some of the other things. Thank you so much. Great ideas, amen? Yeah. Great ideas. Um, myself and Brother Paul, we were talking about you, you will now uh, attend for our youth conference. That's one of the things we need to to do. And all, we can throw this in. Uh, WIJF needs a, a fly. Yes. Yes. Okay. Amen. But I thought there's some good ideas. Uh, the logistics of them, trying to bring them on, would be great. We're going to break right now, and we come back in uh, the five minutes. The ladies are going to be here, and uh, the men are going to be in the room around the side, somewhere that you'll see it. And uh, we're looking forward to a great time. Uh, ladies, I need somebody to testify about what's been going on with the ladies' meeting so we can hear the folk and know what's going on. And again, you'll have uh, some dynamic ladies today that will be sharing the Word of God with you. I believe there's so much in our ladies. There's so much. And many of you have never spoken at a conference. For some of you, it's the first time. Some of you cut your teeth right here. Um, many years ago and now. But it's, it's good, it's good. You got substance, you got style, you got vision. And uh, for the glory of God, we look forward to. You know, I, I used to be the women were a tag along. And uh, we stopped that a few years ago. The minute it reached the Bahamas, we stopped it. We cut it. And every time we come to the Bahamas, it's women speaking to women. Women have substance to offer. And uh, so for, we want to make sure that was emphasized and made clear. Thank you very much. Let's take a break. Sorry? Is it, is it against the law for land to Oh, listen now. Listen. In the Bahamas. Okay, thank you for bringing it up. I, I need your respect. I need the men to be with the men and the women to be with the women. Okay? We can appreciate that because sometimes we got some little things we want to say. We don't need the opposite sex there. All right? Uh, so please, we just want you to honor that and uh, we appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Five minutes. I guess we're all you wonder why I'm in the lady session. I'll be leaving you in just a few, but I have to introduce, uh, of course, my life partner. Of course, I've been married to this lady for more than at least 30 years, would be July coming, 14th of July. Of course, we were dated, we dated for two years. We have two daughters and one son. Um, we met in youth group at Baptist Bible Church. We were all teenagers in the church. Actually, a brother and I, we were close friends. That's my buddy and pastor, Lady Haven. Of course, we were close and I would go by them, but never had interested Never had interest in the, in the sister. We were all friends, talk, laugh, whatever. Until one day, he hit me in the show and said, what do you think of my sister, man? <laughs> so I do like that to her. I say, no, no, She's like a sister to me. And of course, time went on, and I started to pray about it. And of course, uh, she met um, nine of the qualities. I got 10, nine of them on my prayer list. I said, Lord, this might be the one, and didn't know. Of course, in 1990, of course, we did, like I said, for two years, in 1990, uh, July 14th, we were and thank God for her. She's been a faithful young lady. I watched her um, involved in the bus ministry, the Sunday school ministry. And, uh, right now, she runs the teen club at our church called the King's Daughters. 
she's always involved in ministry, and that's what I like about her. She always encouraged me in the things of the Lord, and of course she's been a nurse for more than 35 years. I've been a policeman for more than 35 years, and of course we sort of joined the same year. And of course she's retired now, but she goes back to private surgical during her, uh, her expertise when they called her. And so she's still working, even though she's retired, she's still working doing things here and there. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce the love of my life, the one who I've known for more than 30, not, more than 40 years, more than 40 years. Like I said, we grew up in the youth group, our church together, faithful, loving uh, wife. I, I must say that God has blessed me with a wonderful woman. So right now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my wife, a nurse, Deborah Johnson. Good morning. Good morning. Sometimes when they talk about you, you gotta look around and see who they're actually talking about. Amen. Right? Amen. But ladies, my sisters from all over the Caribbean, including the Bahamas, it's always a pleasure to see you all. And it's always a pleasure to know that we're not alone in our service for the Lord, that we have sisters all over this world, especially the Caribbean, that are serving the Lord like we are. And it's an encouragement every year to be able to fellowship, and it encourages and challenges us to continue keeping on because there's someone across the seas that's doing the same thing. Now, when Pastor Dave spoke with me and asked me to speak on women's health, I thought that I would um, kind of duck out. And so what I did was um, find the expert to come and speak to us. And this morning we have in our presence Dr. Dorita Francis Phillips, one of my friends and colleagues, awesome woman of God that's here to speak with us this morning. And she did it before at New Testament Baptist Church Ladies Fellowship and did an awesome job. And this morning she's back to speak with you on that same topic, Women's Health. And I'm, I'm sure she's going to do an excellent job. And I want you all to make her feel welcome, as we always do. She's Dorita Francis Phillips. She's an obstetrician and gynecologist. She received her undergraduate training at the University of the West Indies, that's UWI, Mona Campus, obtaining a Bachelor of Science degree. From there, she attended medical school at UWI in St. Augustine, Trinidad, and completed her final two years at clinical program in Nassau, Bahamas. She worked as a senior health officer and registrar on the maternity ward at Princess Margaret Hospital, where she and I got to know each other for more than 10 years. In 2014, she obtained her postgraduate studies in Ops and Gynae and now serves as a senior registrar at the Princess Margaret Hospital. Dr. Frances Phillips works privately at Life Medical Associates, where she's a partner. She was, she was born in Turkson Caicos Islands and is happily married to Dr. Winston Phillips. She has one beautiful daughter and has gained three loving children in her marriage. Dr. Francis Williams, Dr. Francis Phillips loves to shop. And I can attest that I always hear her shopping, shopping, shopping. And that's a woman thing. I think we could all gel on that score. She also enjoys traveling, reading, and exercising. Her latest hobby, she said, is crocheting, which she taught herself to do. She enjoys crocheting little babies' blankets and also thicker blankets for her friends in the United States of America. She's a Christian, praise the Lord. And um, she and I can always talk about anything regarding the Bible and Christian walk and talk. And that is how we kind of get to know each other through our talk about the Bible and the things of the Lord. And she's a member of the Grace Community Church. Ladies, ladies let us give a warm welcome to Dr. Francis Phillips. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to Nurse Johnson. Um, thank you for having me here to talk about women's health. But first of all, um, when I got here this morning, I said to myself, now, what has Tabby done? Is it too late for me to chicken out and just run on back to work? But here I am, and I'm hoping that what I say to you today will enlighten us as women to basically live a little bit for ourselves, do a little bit more for ourselves, and try to live healthy lives. Um, so pretty much what Nurse Johnson said about me, um, basically, one of the things that I would like to say is that you never know who you will come into contact with 
as you journey through this life. Nurse Johnson has been basically one of the senior midwives on the ward who I would refer to, even though we were the doctors, but our midwives had far more knowledge and experience. And so many times we would listen to their cautions. And in doing that, we bonded and formed great relationships. And there were many times when she spoke to me spiritually and gave me good advice um, in my marriage and in my personal life. And we still have that sort of contact today. And I'm grateful for her. And I'm grateful to be here to share with you beautiful ladies this morning. So I'm not sure. I'm hoping that I'm a pro or started one woman, but you know. Life is evolving and we're trying to get better spiritually every day. So pretty much what I want to talk about is well women's visit. What is a, you know, if you're well, why do you have a doctor's visit? Um, what do we do at that visit? When the visit action starts? What screening methods we use? And I really want to talk about heart health. Is my new passion is exercise. And I, I know I don't look like that, but you know, we'll talk about that shortly. <laughs> cardiovascular disease. Um, I don't want to bore us with all the talks about cancers, but it's something that we should pay attention to, especially the screening for particular cancers that are com more common here in the Bahamas. And some common issues that women face, and hopefully we'll get to mention a little bit about menopause, but you're all so young, we don't need to talk about menopause, right? <laughs> okay. So, what sets us apart from the man in our lives? Well, women require more health care than men. So, you know, they, men like to jokingly say we need more attention, but that may be true. We live longer than men do most times, right? And there are conditions that are just only suited to women. So, men do not go through pregnancy and childbirth, and they certainly don't go through menopause, and they don't experience what we do. So, these are some of the things that make us separate. We are basically role models in our homes. We are the ones that they refer to when anyone in our homes may be ill, and we are usually the ones to do all the caregiving, even taking care sometimes of our husbands, mothers, correct ladies. So we are the caregivers. And a lot of times, even though we have all of these conditions, we do not have medical coverage. So God made us really to be nurturers, right? So we nurture our children and our husbands, and most times, who do we neglect? Ourselves. Amen. All right, so this is, this is a typical woman, right? We're doing a million things. We're cleaning, we're cooking, we're ironing, um, and we're working. So, you know, some of our parents were stay-at-home moms, and they took care of the house and while our dads went out to work. Well, now we want to be liberated, and we want to have these careers, so we have to combine it all. And so now we are busy being superwoman. So in being a superwoman, we forget ourselves, right? So, but don't feel bad ladies, we've come a long way. Life was much, much harder for women, women back in the day. If you listen to some of your grandmothers and great grandmothers' stories, and you were privileged to know them, they may have said to you, child, right after I was 13, 14, I was married to your great grandfather. We had 13, 14 children, sometimes 17 kids. Contraception was either non-existing or very limited, right, back then. So they had a lot of children, a lot of women had unplanned pregnancies and even died in childbirth. Even though on the maternity ward, Nurse Johnson can tell you, we still have one or two incidents that we cannot avoid, but usually death in childbirth is not a common issue right about now. So life expectancy was shorter then. Most women didn't see 60s and so they didn't have to go through some of the ills of menopause. So we must take charge of our own bodies. We must learn how to maximize our personal health and fitness needs. So be like a good doctor who's trying to get slim, right? No, I'm joking. So we, what we need to, what I found is, and I've learned this late in life, is that exercise does so much good for us, right? So initially, we want to exercise because we want to look slimmer, but that's not the only benefit. So that's a nice cosmetic benefit, right? But there's so many things. And in preparing this presentation, I realized, oh my goodness, I was also speaking to myself. So speak, please don't think that I'm here to condone any of us here because I'm really preaching to me. And so I just want to tell you that 
we have to live healthier lives. And it starts basically with our choice of diet, nutrition, and our exercise. And so once we have a healthy body, we can basically be more productive for our homes, for our spouses, our children, and even in the workplace. So, this is this woman here, we need to put her to rest, all right, and start putting ourselves first. So you know sometimes when we want to steal away and go to the spa, like sometimes I, I tell my husband, I'll be back in about three hours. Well, we need going to work at that. This is my time. So I would encourage you to do it may not be the spa for you, it may not be the hairdresser for someone else, but do whatever it takes for you to take a moment just for you. And it's not a bad idea. It's okay if you leave the children alone. It's okay if you leave them with their fathers. It's okay. Take that time for yourself. What I found out is that because I work a lot of hours and I'm always tired, once I get to that extreme point of fatigue, then my migraines start. But I realized that the medications that I have to take for the migraines have so many other side effects. Number one, it makes me so drowsy, I can't do much other work, right? But guess what helps my headaches to go? Not the exercise. <laughs> when I go to my hairdresser. When I get to that hairdresser shop, for some strange reason, I just unwind, I listen to her talk a lot of foolishness, and when I leave, I'm like, hold on. I don't have a headache anymore. Because my headaches come in clusters and they last for days on end. When it's gone, it's almost like you're doing something and as you're doing it, you realize, oh shucks, the headache isn't here. So I found that going to my hairdresser, I laugh, I talk, and when I get out there, the headache is gone. So for someone else, it may be my other hobby, shopping, or whatever you have to do that takes care of yourself. Okay, so why, why are we talking about that? Uh, why she's connecting our technology stuff? We just briefly talk about um, some of the things that we can help to promote heart health. So basically, what is heart health? Heart health basically is taking care of your heart. So doing the things that's going to decrease the risk of you having heart attacks, um, heart failures, and particularly for women, once we reach over the age of 55, 65, we, tend, we are more at risk of heart failure, heart attacks, than even cancers, believe it or not. And so this is where the nutrition comes in. This is where um, the diet and the exercise comes in. And so we can start by basically altering our Bahamian diet. And so when I looked at one or two pictures that I wanted to show, where we basically had a picture of a plate, and you know how we eat locally. Pretty much three quarters of that plate would be carbohydrates, right? At least a half of the plate would be our rice, and we have some macaroni somewhere, and the potato salad um, piled on, and whatever else. And if there's a salad, one little <laughs> tiny bit, and then the meat sits on top of the rice. But that's not the way that we're supposed to eat, right? So pretty much your plate should be divided your vegetables and your fruits, and 30% carbs and your other 30% of your protein. So you should not be eating more than that. So your plate should never be a mountain top. And so those are one of the first things that we should change. And then the other thing that we should make sure that we're doing is drinking enough water. So the recommendations is at least about eight to nine glasses of water per day. Now that seems like a lot, but if you start, you can start with three, start with four, and give yourself small, short-term goals, and then eventually increase that um, as it progresses. And one of the nuggets that I found is, my daughter, is in, she's in love with water bottles. So every month, she finds a reason why she needs a new water bottle. So she likes these new thermoses that they have out now, the flask. It keeps your water cool all day. It would even keep the ice in it pretty much all day. 
And so she got this really big one. And I must say that God gifted me with a child who loves water and hates candy. Now that had nothing to do with us being in the field of medicine. That's just the way she is. Um, so she drinks water all day. Never had to buy juice for her to send to school. So when the school cut out the juice, it was just great for me because I never bought it anyway. So I thought, okay, it's like these bottles look cute. I'm going to try to order one for myself next time. So she picked out this pretty color one for me, and I loved it, and it goes along with my new gym clothes. And I stopped saying, it to her, yeah, can I would take the water to work and bring it back home? Take it to work and bring it back home. You know, like Sierra, how much of this water do you drink in a day? And she had <coughs> two of them. And so the big one is a 40 ounce. And so basically, I challenged myself, and I said, okay, if I can go through half of this in the beginning, then hopefully, there we go, then hopefully I can get to the full bottle. So now I'm actually drinking 40 ounces minimum per day, and some days, depending on when I work out, I may need two of those. So this is basically the plate that I was basically referring to. So, ladies, you see a ton of rice on that plate. No, right? So there's more vegetables than anything else. So this is basically the way we should eat and drink. Forget about the alcohol on the side. But if you do, if you're a wine drinker, um, nothing more than a glass in the evening that I recommend to peak persons who drink wine. And then of course your multivitamins is basically what's cut off on the side there. Okay, so this basically is just saying to us what we should, where the healthy starches are. So we can still have our starches, but try to eat more healthy starches, more fruits and vegetables, and the basically the basic vitamin nutrition that we get from it. Like your sweet potatoes, your pumpkins, those are more, pumpkin is a vegetable, but a starchy vegetable. So if you have like more your whole grain breads, like anything that's more saturated in, in wheat and grains, like the five grams or three gram breads. I love sweet potato and cassavas. You can have those kinds of stuff, more so than the white, the white rice and that kind of thing. Brown rice is okay as well. Okay, so, all right, so I'm gonna skip some of this basically we talked about. So basically when you incorporate in your diet, and you have your annual physicals. One of the things that we'd like to pay attention to is your measurement, so your numbers. Um, if you go to a gynecologist, we don't typically um, calculate your BMI. If you go more to the family practitioners, they tend to dwell a little bit more on it, but we do note the weight. Um, and so basically, you want to be within a healthy BMI range. Um, not in, if you know your BMI, most of us are within the overweight and obese range, then that tells you what you need to do to modify. In terms of your blood glucose and your lipids, that's your cholesterols, we need to know what those are annually. And we repeat those depending on the results because that gives us risk factors for heart disease as well, okay? Um, so another thing is adequate sleep. Um, at least eight hours, most of us can't ever achieve eight hours. And your screening will be some of the important things to prevent heart disease. Right, so this is basically telling us that for women over the age of 40, you need to have an annual, which will have your blood check, blood pressure checked yearly. If you're in your young 40 year old and you're pretty much healthy, your blood pressure is normal, your cholesterol was done, and it's pretty, really good normal you can actually have that cholesterol test done like every two to three years. Once you're over the age of 45, I definitely recommend that that's done yearly as we start to get into that risk area. And then of course, once you hit the age of 50, you definitely should have those levels done yearly and even to a greater extent, particularly our patients who are hypertensive and diabetics and the cholesterol levels are elevated, we may even have to do what we call an ECG to check your heart. Okay? Well, anything above 200 is high. So you want to have in the 170s, 180s maximum. So that's where you should be aiming to try to work with. If you're above 200, that's a bit much. 
Now, for men, they usually on different range, but for women, I don't like to see between 190 and 200. Try to bring that back down. Um, can, I, can I suggest that you can go to my doctor? This is um, how the presentation is going to be all over. You can leave that. Excuse me, sorry. So what, what I was trying to basically say earlier about the heart disease, so the take home point for heart disease is that it's preventable, all right? So it's not something that we have to go through if we start, even from now it's not too late, to change things about our lifestyle. So it's a lifestyle change, it doesn't happen overnight. Increase the activity, um, find a group that either walks, find a group that work out. Um, I endorse outdoor fitness for how much Craig walk in. It's very good. We have women of all ages and it actually works. And so you would find that exercise and diet goes hand in hand with everything that we talk, we'll talk about. It actually is one of the things that can help to prevent most cancers that women face, even Alzheimer's and dementia. So they promote women that are healthy, women that are, that are active, you have less chances of actually going through dementia, believe it or not. And so remember now too ladies that once you get into the, once we step into that age that's closer to menopause, that we really have to pay attention to heart health because heart attacks are actually the number one killer in women, more so than men, and at a later age. So, 60, 65 for women, 70 is a really risk group that you want to be careful of. So if your cholesterol is high, you want to try stop now to bring that down. Okay? Alright, so then I wanted to speak about some conditions that affect women. Um, this is when I first met Nurse Johnson. <laughs> some of the things that basically Woman. Now I noticed that I, I cut out a lot of the stuff in the beginning and I just wanted to say that for those of you who have young girls, I just want to drop this in so we, since we don't have a lot of young women here, that if you have young girls at home who have nieces or nephews, that the first visit to a gynecologist for young girls should be at least by the age 13, 13 to 15. So in each age group, um, it varies what we do. So 13 to 19, they should have a visit, and that visit will basically be to, you know, look and make sure that they have developed normal female secondary sexual characteristics, the breast, the pelvic area, it does not involve an internal exam, but at least an examination to look to see that everything is normal, to see if their menstrual cycles are occurring normally, and if there's any issues related to that. And we'd like to speak to young girls at this time about stuff like hygiene, vaccines, and it's a time to do a lot of counseling because our young girls face a lot of issues. Um, sexual identity nowadays is something that we really cannot be in the closet about, but we have to talk openly. We have to preach God to them and hopefully that they make godly decisions and keep along that track. It's important. Um, we also have to be mindful that even though we don't want to speak about it, but there is such a thing as sexual abuse. Um, there are other forms of abuse, and so sometimes your girls may not be able to come and tell mommy or tell, tell, come and say to Grammy, but sometimes the doctor may notice something that's not right. And so that is why I like that age group. 
Um, your 21 year olds, this is the year that we start the pap smears. We don't do pap smears before that age group. And then of course, after that age, you should be basically doing your annual physical exam. So if you're not well, if you're well, and you think, well, I don't have any problems, I don't have diabetes, I don't have hypertension, it's not a reason not to get your annual. Because don't forget, we need to be screened for the pap smears and all that sort of stuff. So in terms of other conditions, now moving right along, that affect women, I'm going to briefly talk about one or two of these. And I just wanted to look on this slide, basically, to say that if we read what's in the middle, healthy eating, physical activity, and being lean reduces the risk of most common cancers that affect women. I was a little insulted by that, but anyway, we'll talk to them about that later, right? So that's another reason why we need to work out, correct? Okay, so basically we know... Yes, Sorry. Okay, I'm going to talk about that, but no, I don't, I would not say do it at 21. Yeah. Okay, so that's a very good question. So basically, <clears throat> we want to look a little bit about cervix of um, cancer of the cervix. And I know we've had numerous talks from the Cancer Society about this, I'm not going to dwell too much, but we basically can see where the cervix is right at the neck of the womb. Okay, um, this slide just basically gives a little statistics as to where we are. So cervix cancer, <clears throat> really and truly, no one should be dying in 2020 of cervix cancer, all right? But as you see here, it's still pretty high in the Bahamas and in the Caribbean islands compared to U.S. So in the first world countries of developing, developed countries, the incidence of cervix cancer is basically fallen, but in our developing areas, it's still too high, and we're still working on bringing these numbers down. Now, this statistics was a few years ago. So what we basically found out is that cervix cancer basically is higher in areas where there's no screening protocols, or the screening protocols are very little. And so how do we screen for cervix cancer? And that's usually by doing the pap smear. So we have the old conventional way, or we have basically the newer way to go to, if you go into the public sector, you may see the pap smear is done by the brush and the slide. If you go into your private office or a private doctor's office, they may do it in a bottle with a liquid. That's called a thin prep, and so that's the newer modality. And so basically, what we realize is that 50% of patients who have cervix cancer are just patients who have now had a pap smear. That's awful, right? And then the other 10% are patients who have not had a pap smear in over 10 years. So it takes a long time before the pre-cancer lesions can go on to, to develop into full-blown cancer. So if you're getting your pap smears on time, we can eradicate some of that. So cervix cancer is actually sexually transmitted. And I'm sure that we've heard a lot about the HPV. The HPV virus basically accounts for 70, 80 million, all of our accounts of cervix cancer. And so this is basically why we're doing screenings for patients with um, HPV. So this slide just basically tells you that in HPV, there are a lot of different strains. So it's just like you have the flu virus, a lot of different flu viruses. So there's strains of HPV. The 6 and 11, basically your low risk ones that can cause genital warts. And so for our younger girls, um, this is very disfiguring. It looks like cauliflower leaves, and it can form around the genital area, anywhere around the vagina, where the HPV can circulate. And so it's very disfiguring. It's sometimes difficult to remove, and they require both medicine and surgical removal. Um, and then you have your high risk ones, which are the ones that basically go on to create or cause cancer. So, what we found out is that, so I like this little slide that says one plus two is equal to six. Yes, I did go to school. But, so one is the vaccine. So, your vaccine can help to prevent or eradicate HPV. Two is that it just really requires two administrations of the vaccine. And six, it prevents at least six different types of cancers. In women, it's three, man, three. So for us women, HPV is associated with cervix cancer, vulva, and vaginal cancers. Now, who do we give this vaccine to? And I want to basically say that the vaccines are available. This is what they look like. They're available locally um, here at 
private offices and in our government clinics as the government is trying to promote the HPV vaccine. So when you see, when you're bringing your daughters in that age group, 13 to 15, this is a little late, but still a good time to discuss the HPV vaccine. The CDC right now is basically recommending that the HPV vaccine be initiated in our young girls at, by the age of 11. So it can start, as we know, by nine, but at least by age 11 and before age of 15. So you may ask yourself why. So we are a group of church ladies and we're teaching our children the godly way. And I do understand that and I do promote that with my daughter as well. But we're not with them all the time. And we don't know what can happen. And so if we can actually prevent our kids from having to go through cervix cancer, wards, and for the boys, anal cancers, penile cancers, all that sort of stuff, then why not give them this vaccine that is safe and it's effective and it's been proven. So the ones that we have here in the Bahamas basically the top one, Cerverex, is used by an oncology group because that basically just addresses um, the kinds that cause cancer. The Gardasil is what we usually would recommend for the younger ones. And we, can, we have actually increased giving this to women even in the, at age 45 and beyond. So like the flu virus, if you had, you may say, well, I already had an abnormal pap smear and I'm already 27, 28, I'm married, but I had an abnormal path, they corrected everything, so why am I getting the HPV vaccine now? Because you may have come into contact with strain 16 or strain 31, but there's still a lot more benefits from the other strains that will be given, that will be protected if you do get the vaccine um, before it's too late, basically. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, so because HPV is the cause and factor for cervix cancer, it's just like it's sexually transmitted. So anything that puts you at risk of acquiring sexually transmitted infection will put you at risk of acquiring HPV and cervix cancer. So a number of partners, early ones have sexual intercourse. Basically, if someone that smokes, if you know compromise, so the same sort of stuff. All right. So now, some of the hot topics. That one doesn't show in this slide, I'm sorry. So, because we've introduced the pap smear testing now in the bottle, what is the benefit? So basically, the thin prep, out the, well, they're both good. Let me say that first. I mean, that's a thing. They're both pretty good um, and pretty sensitive. The thin prep allows a higher rate of detection. So the bottle, it allows a higher rate of detection, one, and it can allow you to have longer intervals between your testing, and it can also test for the presence of the HPV virus. So, we do not recommend, we call it co-testing when they do the HPV and the pap smear at the same time, but we don't recommend that we start that before the age of 30, so those are the new guidelines, okay? So we start pap smear, generally 21. Co-testing where you can do the HPV and the pap smear, 30. Now, a lot of women like to ask me, I have to have a pap smear for the rest of my life? No, the good news is, if you've had normal pap smears, you've never had an abnormal pap smear, you can stop your pap smears at the age of 65. <laughs> All right? It's all back to the I know, right? So, we still a long way off, but we live a long way, we live long. I just want a repetition at the age again. <laughs> 65, 65 is been I think that's the best news for the conference. <laughs> <laughs> so see, we live, like, like I said, we are living longer lives. So we live longer, we can get to be 65 at some point, right? So at that point, you don't want to be bothered by the, the pap smear. Now, the drawback to that is, there's always a catch. You can, should have had normal pap smears. Or if you've had CIN2, or greater. So those are your pre-cancer lesions. These things that the doctor tells you, little dysplasia, little abnormality, CN1, 2, 3. Mm -hmm. When you get to two, it ain't much difference between two and three, and you're almost close next door to cervix cancer. So if you leave that CIN2, that can eventually lead to cervix cancer if you just sit and ignore it. So if you've had that, then those are persons that we don't recommend that you stop. 
If you've had the co-testing and they've all been normal over 10 years, then you can stop at age 65 as well. So you're saying that uh, Say that again, I didn't hit the first part. <laughs> right. Well, it has to be, unfortunately, it has to be at least about 20 years for it to be normal. So you're not going to have an abnormal pap smear every time you do a pap smear, right? So it is not all abnormal pap smears. So it's the CIN tooth. So that's really, really severe dysplasia. So if you have a small abnormality, because the abnormality on the pap smears ranges, I look at it like a ruler, 12 inch. So at zero is perfectly normal. At 12, 12 is cancer. Your CIN two, three, one, two, threes, and that seven, eight, nine area, if you're down there two, because the risk of progression to cervix cancer is left alone over 10 years is great, then then those are the people that you know. If you had a pap smear and it's in the other area, four, fives, L cell, your doctor would not have ignored it. They would have done some stats to evaluate you and you would have had repeated paps. Mm -hmm. So depending on what your repeat paps have said after the management of that abnormal pap smear, then you can eventually get to this point. But I had two abnormal paps. Um, I don't know what the, the markings of them were. Right. Well, well, to tell you whether or not you can completely move away from that, we'll depend on what that is. We'll depend on what it is. So let's just say you had a, a abnormal in the range of up to that, and then for the next 10 years, then you've got to treat the body to use the frequent testing mm -hmm. and, and what the body needs to be done to ensure that it does not progress. And you're 65. And then, yeah, and it's you need 65. Then you can stop. That point, Yes. 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 Okay. I mean, they they first step. Okay. Um, right. So you had a cryotherapy. So depending on, so your cryotherapy, you may have been up there in that somewhere in the CIN range, one mm -hmm. two. I'm su I'm suspectful. So you may still have to be watching that up there. Yeah. You may not be the lucky one in sixty five. Get into that too. Okay. <laughs> Get into that too. All right. So, right. So, twenty years. If you have CIN two or more. Oh, sorry. I noticed you said that um, one of the causes that a woman can get cancer is if she has partners who smoking. How how is that? It should be history of smoking. So if you yourself smoke, smoke. If so you're a smoker. So it's not with a partner. No. But if I had that there, probably a typo. It should be history of smoking. So basically, smoking alters your response and it also alters your structures and it puts you more at risk for cervix cancer. Okay. Um, after the hysterectomy, right? So what, let me hear. Can we get a vote? What do you think? So you had a hysterectomy. Can you stop doing your pap smears? Well, I hear people say something. Let me hear. What you, just guess. What do you think? No. No. They said no. They said no. One time to seven years. OK. So let's just say we have a hysterectomy for many different reasons. OK? You may just have had these big old fibroids that cause on you to have bleeding, and in the process of evaluating you before the hysterectomy, you would have been having pap smears. So you should have had a pap smear before you were back on a simple hysterectomy. If your hysterectomy was based on a benign reason, meaning non-cancer reason, then yes. And you had a complete hysterectomy, including removal of the cervix. No prior abnormal pap smears, yes. If you've had a subtotal hysterectomy where they just take off the body of the uterus but the cervix is still left, mm -hmm. sometimes we do that, mm -hmm. depending on why you had the hysterectomy, then yes, okay. you too will need to have your pap smears because the cervix is still there. 
okay? Yeah. On the flip side of that, if you have a complete hysterectomy, including yeah. removal of the cervix, cervix, but prior to that, or it may have been done because you had severe dysplasia, then no, you still would have to have smears. So it's not a smear now of the cervix because the cervix is no longer there, but we're also doing a smear of the vagina and the vault inside of the vagina. Okay. Uh, and we yeah. continue to monitor that. Hmm. Okay, and so it basically goes right back to our good friend HPV, because that little HPV is linked to cervix, vulva, and vagina, hmm. and so that is that is basically the reason. Hmm. Okay, now you may have been very young when you had the hysterectomy, so maybe after 20 years you can still, you know, after 20 years have gone, they usually figure at that point in time it's safe to say, even if you had severe dysplasia. And 20 years has passed, we get stuck. That's our biggest recipe, that's not 65. I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. My son is now 23. Your son is? 23. I got tired of the day I had it. Right. I've had four tumor pregnancies since then. Sure. Um, sure. Suggestion. Yeah, I'll try it for this directly. Because those are fun. Those are so you have, your son is 23, and you've had four pregnancies since then. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. Your, your tubes were tied at the C-section? When I had him, mm -hmm. and then they gave me the After that. But you had a normal vagina delivery? Yes. Um, that is very unusual. And they were all tubal. So I would have suggested that... I'm sorry, we didn't hear the question. Okay, so can I repeat? Yes, ma'am. Right. So she's saying that um, her son is 23, correct? And since she's had him by a normal vaginal delivery, she's had four ectopic pregnancies, meaning she's had four pregnancies with the baby who's in the tube. Okay. So, it's interesting on, almost unbelievable, yeah. Yeah. right? For four, I can see one. Okay. So, can I ask before I answer? When you had the tubal pregnancies, did you have to go in for surgery after that for management, or they treated you? Almost. 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 Three weeks. Three weeks. Yeah. Because you had surgery for it. Yeah. Even though I was pregnant, I just kept bleeding and. Then I started dropping me, and it was like a lot up and down, and I didn't know what was going on until this is like the third one. And so my doctor asked me if I'm going to keep the baby, so I'm pregnant. Baby. <laughs> okay, so usually, if, if you had a tubal ligation, depending on the method that the tubal ligation was done, you can have enough, sometimes enough, residual tube that's left over that can basically, would be called a recanalize. So this is basically your tube. When we tie your tubes, we actually form it in a loop. We tie it, for the most part, we cut it, and we burn it, okay? And then, so what it basically would be for me is this is gone, and you have one end here, one end here. Now, if you were one of those blessed women that had nice, big, floppy tubes, Right? Sometimes, if we didn't take off enough specimen, or even sometimes when you don't have really lengthy tubes, tubes for some reason that were healthy before can recanalize. Now, the other thing is sometimes you can have a risk where um, you've had damage to the tubes, either by acquiring um, some sort of previous surgery so that you've had adhesions on the tube itself. And so what that does is, is, is that it creates a roadblock. So you have this roadblock, um, the tubes came back together, but there was some damage to it because you did have surgery to tie in, so some scar tissue caused a little blockage. So imagine you on the eastern road and one car breakdown, all right? So there's not complete passage for the car. So same way with um, an egg, it's not able to pass completely, so it gets stuck right there and then boom, you have a tubal pregnancy. The other thing is sometimes for different women, you can have scarring in your tooth because of sexually transmitted infections and such. Um, now, the interesting part about it is that usually, I'm thinking, 
if you were managed surgically, because they don't necessarily have to manage an ectopic surgically, but if you were managed surgically and they removed that in someone who was no longer desires of children, then I'm thinking that they would have removed sufficient tube to prevent it from happening two, three, and much less four times. Now, having said that, you can have a removal of the tube, but it's still very unlikely that you can have it more at the attachment of the, the, the more proximal part of the uterus. So sometimes we can get pregnancies forming there, and those pregnancies grow long, far further. So your tube is only very slim, so you can't imagine a nine-month baby fitting in between this cord, right? But if you go up higher to the uterus, and what we call a corneal ectopic and a, and a pregnancy implant there, the, those pregnancies actually could go pretty far. They can actually go pretty far. So you actually have a form fetus that's actually sitting there, and that goes longer before you actually diagnose. So I'm thinking perhaps it was something like that. And then sometimes, of course, like anything else, there's always a failure in every surgery you can have complications. And so sometimes, even in the tubal ligation, there may be a failure of the tubes. And then, hey, Debbie, back in the day sometimes, you know, you may have had your tubes tied by someone, and it may not have been your tubes tied. <laughs> I'm just saying. So no, that's not, that's not, um, that's just being, being funny. But, um, but that's what happened four times. At the Baby, about five months, and I'm like, why am I losing a child if I get tied off? Well, that sounds more like a pregnancy, though. That's yeah.